Not long ago, I posted a statement on Facebook that made someone angry. I know I'm the only one that's ever done that. And so after that experience, I thought, thinking about the lack of civil discourse in our world, I thought it might be good to talk a little bit about that. And in that particular, in that particular post that I made, I was talking about a man who back in September claimed that Jesus would be returning on a specific date in the month of September. And I said that the man making the claim was a heretic. Now, for the record, I stand by my statement. The man is a heretic, unless he has recanted or um, gotten away from that ridiculous statement, and September has come and gone, and Jesus didn't return, so he's a heretic. Now, let me hasten to say that for the most part, especially when I say something in a public setting, or when I write something on social media, I have thought through my statement to what is very likely an unhealthy degree. I obsess over what I'm going to say. I've only removed one post in some 10 years, and that was not because I didn't stand by what I said, but rather because what I said was being grossly mischaracterized and misunderstood. I'm anything but perfect, but I'm meticulous when it comes to my communication. So a guy said that Jesus was going to return on September 13th, or something like that, and I said he was a heretic, a false prophet. I said that because a good rabbi friend of mine said, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. And that good rabbi friend of mine is, I trust, a good friend of yours too. Amen? So, you know how a man is a false prophet? How do you know a man is a false prophet? When what he prophesies doesn't come to pass. It's pretty profound. If a man prophesies and what he says doesn't happen, he's a false prophet. And if Jesus said no one knows when he's returning and a man claims to know the exact day when Jesus is returning, his words are then in direct opposition to what Jesus said. Therefore, he's either completely lost or he's a heretic. Now, I'm not being ugly when I say that. It's a neutral statement of fact. It's like saying Cardinals fans were disappointed at the outcome of the 1985 World Series. I'm not being ugly. I'm just stating a fact. So someone called me out on that statement, and it went from, you shouldn't call him a heretic, to, you should have called to talk to him, to, you should have gone out for coffee. Now, for the record, I don't know the man. I don't have any contact information on him. I'd be happy to talk to him. I was simply responding publicly to what was his nationwide public statement. And then the conversation went on with uh, more dialogue back and forth, and the lady that had posted back said something like, you're ugly, Ken, and your mom addresses you funny. <laughs> to you're a judgmental twit. From there, the conversation went to, you think everybody who disagrees with you is wrong and going to hell, and I thought, kind of. <laughs> but I didn't say it. That is a joke, by the way. And finally, she digressed to, since you're a man of influence, how dare you call out a man who was wrong in predicting the date for the return of Jesus? What little influence I might have is exactly why I called out the man for being a heretic. I want people to know, I want people that I know to know the truth. And the truth is, if what you say is in direct opposition to the very words of Jesus, guess what you are? You're a heretic. Either you're lost or you're a heretic. And the man claimed to be a Christian, so he was, by definition, the latter. The definition of a heretic is a professed believer who maintains religious opinions contrary to those accepted by his or her church or rejects doctrines prescribed by that church. And in the midst of that debate, so-called debate, that exchange, there was much less heat and even little, even more little light. Normally, I don't even respond to such drivel. 
but I felt like it was an affront to Orthodox Christianity. I felt like I had to defend what I said because I believed what I had said, and it was, after all, the truth. And I said it because I want people to know the truth. I want people to know the truth, and if, in fact, in that moment, had I recanted what I said, I think I would have been wrong. In fact, if I recanted what I said every time I was challenged, I'd likely never say another word, except maybe, maybe, at home. Thank you. <laughs> Two of us got that. At the root, that kind of exchange is not about an exchange of ideas. It's about controlling the narrative. If someone can discredit someone or act as if they've been greatly wounded by words or insinuate that there's some kind of subversive agenda, then they're able to take control of the storyline and get one up on the other person. It's exactly why, crit why Twitter was created, right? Or Critter was created, I don't know. Thankfully, now we have twice as many characters to use in making fun of other people. If I could describe with a word picture what conversation in the modern era looks like, this is what I would say. It's two people standing on walls that run parallel to each other with a vast sea below. And each person is hoping that the other person falls off the wall so he won't have to listen to what the other person says. And the people on each wall possess weapons loaded with poison, knowing the other person on the opposite wall is going to say something which will merit firing the gun of the tongue filled with poison in an attempt to silence, belittle, shame, if not assassinate the other person. That's kind of where we are these days, isn't it? I thought it would be a good time to just reiterate then some biblical thoughts related to how we communicate. So what's the answer? Well, it's found nestled in the book of James, and we're going to look at it. So we take a break from Matthew's gospel for a couple of weeks, and James is going to offer what I think is some really good advice. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. I'll invite you to stand as we hear the word of the Lord. James 1, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear. Say that with me. Quick to hear. Slow to speak. Say it with me. Slow to speak. Slow to anger. Say it with me. Slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Good advice. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Now, I know that I shouldn't have to say that about a message that's about listening, right? But listen carefully. I want to be sure that you understand. In context, James is first and foremost dealing not with how we simply interact with one another, but most importantly, how we interact with the Word of the living God. If you have your Bible opened, and if you don't, your name's going to show up on the screen, you're going to notice that just above verse 19, there's a paragraph header that says something like, hearing the Word of God, or hearing and doing the Word of God. And we know that's not in the original text of Scripture, but it says something like that. That's mainly what James is talking about here. So the main concept related to hearing and speaking has to do with one's interaction with the Word of God. But certainly the hearing and the speaking can also be alluding to interactions with other people in a broader sense. There's a lot of misunderstanding these days. There's a lot of anger and edge in communication these days. Sometimes I think it would be helpful to say, look, everybody catch your breath. I mean, there's a lot of misunderstanding, right? So how do we combat that? Well, I'm glad you asked. First of all, we should be quick to hear. Say that with me. We should be quick to hear. Verse 19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear. It's important to remember that in James' day, they would have 
had to hear the gospel communicated in order to actually get it. They didn't have countless copies of the New Testament lying around in their homes. When they met for church, they would meet in house churches, and they would have to literally listen for the gospel of Jesus. In fact, listening was vital to their spiritual growth. In fact, of necessity, listening was primary. They could only hear the New Testament Scriptures. Most of them never had the opportunity to actually read the New Testament Scriptures. So those who did not make it a priority to develop good listening skills would be behind the curve, spiritually speaking. So what has changed in that regard? Well, frankly, I'm not sure a whole lot has. In other words, while we now have the luxury and, in fact, the great joy of being able to actually read the Word of God, we still need the discipline of hearing God speak as His Word is read or as His Word is expounded or as His Word is being taught and proclaimed. The point is we as people of God are supposed to be quick to hear. That is certainly true of what should happen when we're exposed to the Word of God. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, every time the Scripture is read, every single time the Bible is taught, every time it is preached, every time it is proclaimed or even discussed, we have the opportunity to hear from God. Now, I'm absolutely certain that this does not apply to this group, and I mean that with all sincerity. But you know, as well as I do, there are people who don't want to hear the Word of God. Because if they hear it, they can't control the proverbial narrative. They don't want to hear from God. Because they know if they hear from God, if He's God, He has the last word. And you and I both know that God has already spoken, correct? God has spoken, right? So God has spoken. It's a done deal. And I'm telling you this morning that what God has spoken about any subject is, in fact, the last and most important word on any subject, can I get a witness? But the culture doesn't want to hear from God because they want to control the proverbial narrative. It's why our nation is reeling from the acceptance of immorality of all kinds. Many of them know what God has already clearly said. A lot of people in our nation already know what God has clearly said. They just don't want to listen. If you don't believe that's the case, then I dare you to go to any bar in Kansas City and talk about drunkenness. Go to any buffet and talk about gluttony. You'll find out pretty quickly what the world doesn't want to hear. But we don't even hear each other. Be quick to hear. Really, really listen. Generally, if someone is speaking to you and you have to say, I'm sorry, what was that? Generally, they're either speaking too quietly, a loud car just drove by, or you're not listening. And as we listen, this is an important side note, it's imperative that we not judge the motives of other people. You see, too often we make up our mind before the other person even has a chance to finish speaking. And I know this is true. I know this is true about speaking in private. I know this is true about speaking in public. In fact, every person in this room made a judgment about me the moment I stood up and said good morning. It's true. And that's the way it is with individual conversations as well. People too quickly evaluate. The key is not to assign motive or jump to conclusions when we're talking with other people. This is important in conversation as well as being important in hearing the Word of God. Give the benefit of the doubt. Find out all that God has to say, just like we ought to find out all that somebody else has to say. People say, for example, the Bible is pro-slavery. No, it's not. It's not. Have you read the book? It's not pro-slavery. Or they'll say, Christians are inconsistent because they're okay with eating shellfish, but they're not okay with gay marriage. Who lets them choose? People don't get it. And the reason they don't get it is because they jump to a negative conclusion. They haven't taken time to do the really hard work of hearing what we're saying or hearing what the Bible is, in fact, saying. In our culture, we don't listen anymore. If the last presidential election taught me anything, it taught me that. 
It's about all it taught me. People jump to conclusions. It's why, for example, when things get tense, clarification might be necessary. It's in those moments that the conversation needs to be slowed. It's why sitting across from one another is always preferable to emailing or texting. You can't, you can't get emotion and expression and pathos the same way typically through those mediums. But if we talk, we might understand one another. Hearing someone is a way that we demonstrate respect. And we can respect other people even when we disagree. Let me finish this section up by offering a quote and then some helpful tips about hearing. First, the quote, this is from Kent Hughes. He writes, we must work at truly listening to others. Listening requires an intense interest in the other person. As Simon Keistmaker says, listening is loving the neighbor as oneself. His concerns and problems are sufficiently important to be heard. This requires eye contact and sensitivity to the other's gestures and moods and silences. We must limit our exposure to the visual media, he continues. If we do not control our time, the media will. And if they do, they will impair our ability to hear. We must read God's Word, and that involves more than advancing a bookmark. It means listening as we read. We must slow down and take time to listen, perhaps praying Samuel's eager words, speak for your servant, is listening. We must prepare for worship and the hearing of God's Word. Let me ask you this morning, not to be preachy, because I have to deal with the same stuff, how much time did you spend before God preparing to get here this morning? How many, how many minutes were spent saying, Lord, help me worship you today, help me learn something today that might change my life? So be quick to listen, James says. This is a present act imperative meaning we have to keep at it. It's not one and done forever. We have to continually maintain a quickness, if you will, to listen. So let me give you some helpful thoughts about hearing. Don't assume motive. Listen to the end. Don't get derailed with something said prior to the conclusion of one's statements. Offer the benefit of the doubt until it's crystal clear exactly what is meant. Think on what is said. Mull it over. Ask clarifying questions if you need to, and then think before you speak. What do you mean? Let that question sink in for a moment. What do you mean? Let that question be emblazoned in your mind. What do you mean? I'm growing convinced that right behind John 3.16 in importance are those words. What do you mean? As a culture, as a people, we talk a lot, don't we? The problem is we don't always understand one another. We don't hear each other. We need to understand what other people are saying and ultimately what other people actually mean. And we won't understand what they actually mean even if we hear what they're saying if we jump to a negative conclusion. Celebrated psychologist Dr. Paul Turnier has memorably said, Listen to the conversations of our world. Between nations as well as between couples, they are, for the most part, dialogues of the deaf. What did he mean? What did he mean by that? Millions of words are spoken around the globe every second, but very few of those words and those sentences and those paragraphs will actually be heard. So, we should be quick to hear. Secondly, not only we should be quick to hear, we should be slow to speak. Verse 19, yet again, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. I'm, I'm tempted at this moment to offer you all the terse one-liners I know about speech. Things like Zeno's saying, we have two ears and one mouth, therefore we should listen twice as much as we speak. Or my personal favorite, speech is silver, silence is golden. The importance of being slow to speak is connected to speaking the Word of God. 
James makes it clear in chapter 3 that one should be extremely cautious about becoming a teacher of the Word. In fact, in James chapter 3 and verse 1, let's notice what he says. He writes, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. We have to give great thought to what we say in particular, when we purport to speak for God. Have you thought about what a daunting challenge that actually is to stand up and say, I believe this is the word, I have a message from God. We've got to be so unbelievably careful in handling the truth of the Scripture in that way because those of us who teach and preach and proclaim and lead in that way will be judged not only by people, but more importantly by God with even greater strictness. Once a word is spoken, you know as well as I do, it can't be retrieved. You and I cannot unhear negative or hurtful things that we've heard. I have a hunch, if you're like I am, you're more likely to forget most of the compliments or encouraging words that you've received, but you seldom forget the negative ones. And the truth is, even within the body of Christ, we don't seem to get that, the power, if you will, of the tongue. You, you can't hurt people with your words and not expect them to be affected. My experience is likely just like yours, except the exception would be that I talk in front of a lot of people. And so I talk a lot. In fact, I know you're thinking right now, I wish I'd quit talking. Through the last 30 years or so, I've had people say hurtful things to me and then act as if nothing ever happened. I've told you about the lady that wrote the five-page letter telling me how terrible I was because I bought a house that wasn't in the same neighborhood as the church I was serving at the time. And I wanted to say, ma'am, if you only knew the truth, I could give you some stuff that would make you realize how terrible I actually am. And then after a few years, she asked me to preach her funeral because she said I was such a good pastor. Now, now let me ask you, what do you think I'm going to remember? You know. Choose your words carefully. Once spoken, they can't be retrieved. The problem is it's hard to forget, isn't it? It's hard to forget. Negative words directed toward us wound us deeply. They're not the same as everyday conversation. It's likely you wouldn't remember 20 cars that would speed past you, but if you saw a terrible accident, those images would be emblazoned upon your psyche. You will remember details about that moment that you would otherwise typically have dismissed. You won't remember the regular conversations with others. You will remember the times you were confronted, talked about, talked down to, shamed, or belittled. You remember that. You remember that, don't you? The Apostle Paul did a beautiful thing for the body of Christ when he encouraged us with the following words. He writes, No foul language should come from your mouth but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. Don't you want to be a grace giver with what you say? At the risk of sounding like a Coca-Cola commercial or a Hallmark card, the truth is the world would be a much better place if we all took our time thinking through what we were going to say. Now, let me just very practically remind us of the benefits of being slow to speak. We can more clearly articulate what we're thinking if we're actually thinking before we speak. We can more readily avoid speaking out of school, as they say. In other words, talking about things we really don't comprehend. We can more easily avoid hurting others' feelings if we take the time to formulate our response. We can avoid lying if we take the time necessary to actually know what we're saying is true. Taking our time to speak allows us to answer these vital questions before we actually talk. First of all, is it true? Is it true? Secondly, does it edify? There are a lot of things that are true that really don't need to be talked about, right? How might it be understood or misunderstood? Is it fitting? Is it necessary. So certainly before you speak for God or 
before you even simply speak to each other, before you utter a word, mail that letter or click the mouse. Think it through. Think it through. As someone said, I've never had to take back something I didn't say. So we should be quick to hear. We should be slow to speak. Thirdly and finally, we should be slow to anger. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. We should be slow to anger. James knew that people who don't listen to the word could begin to speak as fools. Then anger sets in. Someone becomes angry. Somebody else becomes angry. Somebody else is angry. And all of this is in the context, by the way, of the church, in the context of the people of God. And James says, there's anger, and we're going to be angry, and they're going to be angry, and she's angry, and he's angry. And as someone said, pretty soon the church is no longer a lighthouse, but rather a towering inferno. We don't listen well when we're angry. We don't speak well, typically, when we're angry. The book of Proverbs is replete with encouragement and instruction about anger and bridling one's tongue. There are good reasons for that. We should be slow to anger. Do you ever think about what makes you angry? Someone gets your parking spot. First of all, is it really yours? I mean, like, did Walmart set that one aside just for you? I mean, I know they did for me, but did they for you? <laughs> or uh, someone, someone moves into your lane when you're driving. They, they change into your lane. It's not your lane, right? Or someone interrupts your life. If you're a believer in Jesus, same, same thing. It's not yours. In fact, the Bible says you have been bought with a price. Do you see a pattern emerging here? This beautiful little section of Scripture is simply a reminder of how to live. It's really, really good advice. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Receive the implanted word that is the gospel with meekness and then live out its implications every single day of your life. It's really just good advice. So let me close with just a little more advice. Source unknown. And some of this, just to be honest with you, is much, much easier said than done. But it's still worth striving for. And it rhymes. <laughs> Forget each kindness that you do as soon as you have done it. Forget the praise that falls to you the moment you have won it. Forget the slander that you hear before you can repeat it. Forget each slight, each spite, each sneer whenever you may meet it. Remember every promise made and kept to the letter. Remember those who lend you aid and be a grateful debtor. Remember all the happiness that comes your way in living. Forget each worry and distress. Be hopeful and forgiving. Remember good, remember truth, remember heaven is above you, and you will find through age and youth that perhaps some will love you. <laughs> and listen carefully. Even if they don't, Jesus will. <laughs>